Well, welcome everybody to our webcast today, Why Hunting is More Than Looking for Threats. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Matt and Brian. Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for making the time to join us here. Uh, I'm Matt Peters, I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Expel. Uh, just a little bit about me, I, I run our engineering team that built our platform. I run our operations team that looks for threats 24 by seven. Been doing this work for kind of a while and like threat hunting and hunting in general, data analytics is kind of a, a passion of mine. Uh, Brian? Yeah, Brian Dravo, Senior Detection and Response Engineer. Um, I help write and create detections for the platform and um, help with uh, creating the, the hunts for the hunting team. Um, I have about 24 years of experience in IT security in particular. Um, so nice to, nice to be on this webinar. So in terms of setting the, the stage agenda-wise for what we're going to do, um, what we're going to uh, do is start talking a little bit theologically about how we think what threat hunting is or what hunting is, because we, we sort of have a notion that it might be more than just uh, looking for threats. Um, so once we do that, uh, that sort of theological background, we're going to end up diving into a specific uh, um, hunt that uh, Brian's going to walk us walk you through, like the methodology that we use and some of the results that we found and that kind of thing. And it's going to be pretty detailed. We're going to you know, dive into some Jupyter notebooks and things like this. And once we're through all that, we'll pause for questions, maybe a spirited debate, that sort of thing. So what we're going to do then um, is sort of fundamentally to set the stage, one of the things I love about threat hunting is if you take three people and you put them in a room, you will get four opinions about what threat hunting is. And, and so we have a particular vantage point. And I'm going to start uh, uh, spending a little bit of time on that. And to do that, what I'm going to do is do it the way I start almost everything, which is with an obscure but hopefully relevant historical analogy. Uh, so it turns out in London in about 1854, there was an outbreak of cholera. Um, and it, at the time, they didn't know what caused cholera, so the folk, folks were getting pretty panicked, and the net result of, of it was that hundreds of people were dying. Um, so along came this guy, Dr. John Snow. Ironically, I think he went on to become king in the north, um, and he had a theory. So he was, a, he was a, a general practitioner at the time, and he said, hey, there might be an environmental cause to this disease. Like, there might be something environmental about this. Um, so he traveled to the neighborhood, and he noticed that all the deaths were really concentrated in one part of the neighborhood. That, that wasn't immediately obvious to anybody, because when they used to write down deaths at that point, they would just write down part of your address and your name and the, and, and the date. And so um, what he did was he mapped out the deaths. This map is actually the map that he, uh, or reproduction of the map that he did. And uh, what became kind of obvious to him is that the cases were kind of roughly surrounding the water pump on Broad Street. And based on this, um, what he did was he just went and he took the handle off and the cholera epidemic subsided. And so, you know, mystery solved, uh, the water was tainted, right? Now, why is this important in this context? And, and the reason is because it has to do with a class of problem solving that we think provides a useful structure for thinking about hunting in general. Again, more than just threat hunting. In its simplest form, what John Snow actually did was he developed a thesis about the problem. He said, like, this, this problem has a physical extent. He wasn't one of those people who's like, it's the vapors. He was actually saying, hey, I actually think there's a physical cause to this. And when you're looking for something environmental or physical that has an extent, uh, a tool to help look is a map. So what he did was he went and he said, hey, I'm going to uh, acquire some data. I'm going to bounce it against my, my, um, my down select algorithm or my articulation, which in this case was a map, and I'm going to see what I find. And so to us, that thesis driven data collection, down select investigation, that's sort of the crux of hunting in general. Um, and so it's divided into, for us, a set of techniques. We, we uh, evaluate the hypothesis given some data, and, and th that forms a discrete thing which generates some results. So in a lot of places, threat hunting is whatever happens when you take a bunch of really smart folks and drop them in a sim and uh, with a bunch of log data, and they search around like they're searching for truffles. And, and while that activity might not be a bad thing, and we actually think it's hugely useful, it, it, isn't the, it isn't the sum total of it. We actually think this, this activity exists in, a, in, in context, in a continuum. And so... As technologies have gotten better, one of the questions we get asked is where does hunting fit? Like, where does it fit? Like, how do I think about hunting relative to my detection infrastructure? I've got this UEBA product. It does advanced analytics. How do I think about that? Well, the way that we think about this is that on, on one end of the continuum, you have what we would call exploratory data analysis. That's smart people sitting in a sim, kind of looking around for things that look weird. If you're sitting in an Excel spreadsheet with a fixed width font or looking at a sim and sort of graphing things against other things to look for anomalies, you're doing exploratory data analysis. A lot of people power. It's really labor intensive. And so a lot of times it's actually beyond the um, capabilities of a lot of teams because they just don't have the, the person power for it. A little bit further over is what we uh, refer to as targeted threat hunting. That's that sort of, I have a thesis. I think that if I look for this, 
I can do this. Um, and so there the people power goes down a little bit because we're going to replace a lot of that people power with automation to collect data, automation to down select based on a thesis, investigative techniques that we might be able to automate, that sort of stuff. But we, we're still using a lot of human judgment because we're not getting to like immediate, um, uh, uh, you know, this is bad, this is not. You just generate a lot of leads from it. And then, you know, if you if you take a targeted hunt and you really tune it down, if you really, you get it to the point where you've like, you've, you've uh, matched up the inputs and the outputs and all of the impedances and things like this, you can actually get it to be what we would think of as an anomaly-based detection. If you think about UEBA technologies today, five years ago, those were targeted threat hunts, right? So you would say, well, we're going to look at VPN logins or something like this. Well, now Exadine has a product that does that as an example. And so that's where we get into anomaly-based detection. And if they get even further, if it gets into the point where like, actually, I'm not surfacing up a maybe, I'm surfacing up a definite, then you're all the way to detection. And so an algorithm or a method or a theory can start all the way at exploratory data analysis and move all the way through to detection over time. So how do we do this? How would we move something from A to, a to uh, Q in this case? So first off, we're gonna pick an attacker tactic. So for this example, like try to spot something like traditional endpoint attack, DLL hijacking, something like this. Um, from that technique, we're going to develop a hypothesis about the kind of data we would need to go grab. Um, I think we can spot this by looking for files named like standard libraries, and they're just not standard library locations. Okay, and then we're going to gather data. In this case, file listings from a bunch of hosts, and uh, then we're going to filter that data and look for anomalous patterns. This is like, you know, John Snow doing the distance from the water pump was sort of his down select. I think in in this case, what it would be was like, okay, well, you know, how different is the file uh, path from the normal file paths? And then now we're going to say like anything with a count of greater than X, maybe we're going to investigate. So that's the, the the step three and step four: gather the data, filter it to find unusual activity, and then re reviewing the results and investigating. Key thing here is we got to understand that this is a this is an iterative process, right? We refine as we go. What we discover about normal might be different than we thought. And so over time, we're gonna encode that and having the right technology to encode that is kind of the key here. So what we're gonna do is like, that's our process. That's sort of how we think about it. And now Brian's gonna walk you through like a specific example of us doing that for real. Yeah, so thanks, Matt. Uh, you were spot on on, on on what you mentioned in, in, in all areas, but that's that generally the way I've been thinking about hunting all these many years. So, um, you know, and one of the things I think it's great is that you were able to use terms like vapors. So, you know, the only way to really cure that was doing things like taking the air or going to a sanatorium. So um, now that I've been able to use old Victorian timey <laughs> language like sanatorium and taking the air, um, I wanted to add a few things about uh, what we mean when we say hunting. Um, so one of the things we also take, take a look at is prevalence of the technology. So um, how prevalent is the technology industry? How well adopted is it? Um, then we also, the other component is tooling and visibility. Um, does this technology allow us to pull enough data so that we can whittle it down? And does it provide the right kind of data so we can test our hypothesis? Um, we use this, we use these methods to actually then run what we call a controlled test uh, to get on the idea of the results. And once we vetted the test, we then develop the hunt. Um, and so how does this look um, in terms of when we actually run a hunt? So uh, you, you, there's a lot of words here, um, but essentially to break this down in a really simple way is that we use the techno your technology and our robots to grab a bunch of raw logs. We take that technology and um, we whittle it down. So what we end up doing is actually whittling down, for example, in the case of um, if we're looking at AWS CloudTrail logs, we would be looking at things like let's uh, focus on service and let's focus on specific API calls. So maybe like EC2 modification activity that's added um, to actually look to whittle that information down. Um, then we also enrich the data. So we'll take this information and we'll enrich it for, you know, has it been reported as malicious uh, by a third party source? Has it, has it been identified as a Tor exit node? Um, has it been, um, you know, what's the GOIP information that's associated with it? What's the um, ASN information? All of that will, will, will we add as enrichments. Um, and so, and then what we end up doing is actually taking that inf information down and applying a lot of frequency and behavioral analysis to this information. So um, essentially, once we get to this point where we're actually in the process of, of, of looking at investigative leads, what we've done is, to use the analogy before, is uh, we're taking you truffle hunting, except instead of just taking you truffle hunting, we've given you a trained pig that's hungry, that has a great nose, and knows in general where to look, right? 
Um, and then as a final component is we have automation built uh, because again, we love robots. We have automation built in the workbench that allows us to do, to provide additional context analysis to the, um, to the investigation. So, so what's important here is um, all of this is created to allow uh, our hunters to make three or more judgment calls, which is why it's hunting and not detections, right? Uh, remember, human judgment is key and creating groupings of judgment calls allows for much easier decision-making on potential anomalous threats. So um, now let's take a step back and let me start and, and, and switch over and actually show you this hunt. So let me take you to the top here. Um, so uh, this is a hunt for AWS IAM new user. So uh, this hunt, um, you know, the hypothesis is, can we find attackers that are maintaining persistence by creating new IAM users in AWS by looking at CloudTrail logs? Um, this is actually a real hunt. It's been anonymized um, to protect the innocent. Um, but what I wanted to show you is, I want to show you how we whittle the data down. So let's, let's take a look at frequency analysis here. And so you can get a, a sense. So what you're seeing here are tables where we've um, basically down selected information so that we can start pulling together different judgments. Um, the very first one, the very first table is, these are users that are creating user accounts. So you can see that one user in particular is creating most of the user accounts. Um, we were, and again, this data has been modified, so you, but the, the naming convention indicated that it was something that was tied to a service account. Um, and, and so you can see how many are here. And then these other users, which again, also were modified, the naming convention for these users were all tied with, um, with an admin account. You can see that all of them were creating users and they were all admin accounts, right? So this is something that we were we're looking, and when we look at the data, we, we, we take note of these things. Um, the one we wanna look at is this Justin Drake user, because this user is only creating one, one account, um, which is odd because oftentimes it's more than just one account. So what we'll end up doing is, is we take this information about down selection and we start the process of investigating this activity, right? Um, actually, uh, let me go here. And so we can see that Justin Drake really did only create uh, one, uh, one user and there was only one session. Um, the first thing that we look at is we look at the IP. Uh, that's one of the things I, I, I look at. Um, that, that then pairs really well to the IP address here. So you can see that the same IP address 205.52.33 was the same one that was actually used by this particular user. So there was one connection for this one admin account, which again is also very strange because oftentimes it's usually, um, you know, the admins are using similar IP addresses to be able to connect. So again, we have, now we have two interesting pieces of judgment, right? We have an, uh, an admin account that is creating one account um, that is associated with an, uh, an infrequently used IP address. The other thing here that we noticed immediately is that this user was not using MFA. So um, we were able to further corroborate this information by using some of our workflows, but essentially this user was not using MFA for this activity. So again, another judgment, um, that another piece of information that allows us to make a judgment on, okay, this is really sort of, uh, this is moving towards um, us considering this suspicious. The final piece of information and this has been modified again, was is that the user that was created was actually a name that's outside the normal naming conventions of the users that we were seeing when we were looking at all the data. So again, um, if you think about this from the perspective of, uh, of, of looking at this and, and from an additive sense, you can see that the judgments were admin is infrequently used from an infrequently seen IP address, not using MFA to add a user that had an odd naming convention. This is a very good example of, and, and this would we, we, we categorize as suspicious and reported to as part of the hunt. So, um, and you can see how this process works as we start to um, down select and, and uh, take the down select information and use that to actually um, create and, and, and create investigative leads. Um, and those leads that then, then we report as potentially something that's beyond normal, suspicious, malicious, that type of activity. Um, now let's take a look at another one, right? So we, we looked at, we looked at the, the, the user ARN. Now let's take a look at this IP address. Um, this is the only other IP address that has a count of one, uh, again, um, outside of normal. And so let's take a look at this source IP. And what we can see here is, uh, let's take a look at the user ARN. Now, this is really strange because this user ARN is, 
is John 68. And we know that that user in particular is actually the user that we called out as being a service account, a lot of activity coming from that user. So if we take John 68 and we look at the normal activity of that user, we can see that, let me bring that up a little bit here. We can see that that user was using a different IP address. So again, this, um, this is a, a, we're looking at pieces of information that's allowing us to tie together different judgments. Uh, we have an admin that's frequently used that is actually using uh, an infrequently used IP address, very odd. Um, and now let's take a look at the session information again for this user, because I think it's important to go back and complete reviewing that session information. And uh, we can see here uh, a couple of things that you won't be able to identify because they're, again, it's been obfuscated. One, um, uh, they weren't using MFA. It was actually inconsistently being used. You can see it with, within the, the actual, um, we validated this through a couple of different means, including the workflows that we have within Workbench, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and then the last component was access key. The access key was actually a long-term access key, which is outside of normal that you have um, a long-term access key that's, that's used, it's not a best practice. And so all of those components together, um, you know, uh, bubble this up as being a suspicious activity that we then report. So um, now uh, what I want to show you very quickly was investigative actions that are tied to this because, you know, when I kept talking about their workflows that we have. So what we have is it within, within Workbench is the ability to actually go and pull additional information from different technologies and, and to actually do analysis of that information. This is what our workflow looks like. So we have different workflows that we use. So for instance, in this case, the ones I would use as part of this activity would be triaging suspicious login, looking at uh, login from third-party MFA sources, and then triaging activity in AWS. As you can see here, you can actually put any data in here in terms of text, and it will actually go and filter that data and pull in all the information that's associated with that. And this again, helps us provide more context um, to the actual investigation. So. Uh, as part of this, what I wanted to do was uh, quickly show you what that looks like from the perspective of, of, of the information. So as you can see here, I pulled up and, and actually created um, and you know, an anonymized information that was tied with this user, Justin Drake, right? And so what we can see here is, is that over a month's worth of activity, most of the other users, if you saw their month's worth of activity, they had a lot of activity that they, that they did as admins. They were you know, adding EC2 instances, making changes to, our, to RDS, for instance, in this case, this user was doing very little activity. So this further um, enhances our suspicions about this activity, just because it was so limited in scope for an admin user for a month's worth of activity. And so this helps further provide context to um, what, we're, what we see. Um, in addition to that, when we're looking at our workflows, one of the things that we also keep in mind is that um, our workflows allow us to look at things like create users, if ingress rules have been created, egress rules, we point these, these, these things out and we, all, we you use that to help further validate the patterns of activity that this user is doing and what things are outside of normal, what things are um, you know, considered bad practices, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this gives you a good sense of how we use the workflows within Workbench. And so with that, what I wanted to do is I wanted to now um, really talk about the report. So I wanna hand it back over to Matt and, and we can discuss um, the report in more detail. So just as a really quick thing and to sort of cap it off, like we've gone and we've, we've developed a thesis that said something about, you know, how people are going to use IAM to um, establish persistence. We ended up um, diving into that data and sort of looking around for anomalies. So, okay. Um, and what we want to do is we want to then like have at the end of this activity, at the end of this like, like period of hunting, we want to have a report because otherwise we're sort of like, well, you know, it all went great. And so in our reports, what we tend to do is, is cover a couple of things. So first off, we map all of the hunting techniques that we're looking at to the MITRE ATT&CK framework um, so that we can sort of see, because we think about it as like augmenting detection coverage, recall the, the, the continuum it exists on. So we want to know like, okay, what, what is this hunt supposed to uncover? We then talk a little bit about the kind of data that we uncovered. We found that instrumenting our hunts to say, um, you know, how much data are we processing? How many things are we looking at? How well are the downslides working are critical? Because that tells us where we are in that flow. 
is this a um, literally uh, uh, you know one step away from just people looking at a sim? Um, is this now approaching an anomaly um, uh, based detection uh, based on how good the down selects are and stuff like this? So in this case, we looked through about 770,000 records. We pulled that many back. We down selected those and our analyst actually only looked at five uh, after all of our algorithms and all of the, the sort of down select logic worked. Uh, and that got us to three insights. And this is where we go into like something kind of interesting, going down to take a look at the insights that we actually provided the the things that we learned, um, uh, I would call out three things. So the first one is the first insight that we figured out was we figured out like what's going on in the environment in general. So as we are doing one of these uh, hunts, we're learning something about the baseline. And so as you're thinking about doing a, a threat hunt using whatever technology you're using, think about the idea that you're going to be learning things that aren't just specifically about a compromise. It may well be about like this is the naming convention we use, or this is the uh, way hosts are identified, or this is the, the the number of activities we normally have here, because those those baselines turn into good down selects or good alerts next time. So now going forward, Brian said, hey, that doesn't follow our naming convention, the host naming convention or the, the uh, user naming convention. The way we learned that was by doing this hunt in a previous month. Um, so the second thing that we've, we've called out is like who uses what APIs, how often and from where. Again, what's the baseline? What's activity normally looking like? And then the last piece was this notion of a multi-factor key um, or, or, a, or a, actually a, a long-term key that didn't have MFA turned on. And the idea here is that like sometimes what we're finding is we're actually not finding evidence of compromise, we're finding evidence of risk, right? And so being open to the idea that like the hunt may uh, result in a bunch of that database is, is not encrypted or uh, that thing is weird or you, we've misconfigured this, a bunch of best practice kind of things that we find in the environment. So we expanded that aperture from just threat hunting, just compromised hosts to allow for that. And that takes us into remediation actions where we're asking, the, the, uh, uh, hey, we should change something. We should change, change a particular setting. So uh, Brian? Yeah, and so with remediations, um, you have, Remediations are broken up into two things uh, within our, within the hunting reports. One is um, remediations are essentially immediate call to actions on activity that you need to address right now. In this case, it's disable and modify AWS access keys as, as a result of the hunt. Um, and then we what we have are resilience recommendations. And these are really more sort of operational long-term, you know, sort of planning horizon uh, activities around reducing risk over time. And so um, these are the things that we provide you in the report so that you can use them to address this type of activity in the short term and in the long term. All right, so that sort of takes us through that. And I think what we're gonna do is kind of uh, um, circle back around um, uh, to see if there are any uh, questions that uh, we've gotten from the uh, audience. Chrissy? Awesome, yes, so we do. We have a few questions and I will start with question number one. Is there an anomaly detection routine that you like to use the most? Okay, so that's a really good question. I will say to start with, yes, I have several that I, I really enjoy. Um, but at the risk of getting a little too theological, the algorithm isn't necessarily as important as the data. Um, so for instance, we use something like XGBoost uh, um, uh, because it's, it, you know, as a tree method, it's explainable, that kind of thing. But what we're really after is we're after understanding what the data is that we're looking at first and making sure that data is clean. Um, and, and, and then once you understand what the data is looking at, I mean, if you have a two-dimensional problem with separable classes, linear regression could get it done. The algorithm becomes a little bit less of a factor. I'll caution everybody, and this is sort of like, you know, part of a pet peeve of mine, which is, um, Algorithms will oftentimes show you what you what you kind of what you want them to show. So one of the things that's very common is to use something like k-means clustering or something to detect anomalies. And k-means like you pick k, so you it will give you as many clusters as you ask for, even if those clusters don't mean anything. So as you're doing your initials when you're when you're moving from hey exploratory data analysis into a targeted threat hunt, I would caution everybody to take a step back after you've gotten your first set of, uh, of algorithms applied. So if you're using say a random forest or something like this and say, okay, well, yeah, like what, what does it look like? And if I change any of the input parameters, like what happens to my, my, my outputs? Um, the other thing that we've, we've discovered is that in data cleaning or data prep, there's a couple of things that really work, uh, have been working wonders for us at least. So if you're, if you're familiar with like one hot encoding or taking uh, data that is not necessarily uh, renderable as a table and turning into that using something like one hot encoding, we've actually found that minhash works really well for that as well. And, um, and is actually an algorithm that, that, that uh, um, at least for us is, you know, it's much easier to, uh, to employ because of a high dimensional space uh, issues that we found. Um, and then the last piece is debugability. Like at the end of the day, the algorithm that you pick um, we find that when we deploy them in production, 
having actual engineers be able to poke the thing with a stick and say what's going on with this is actually critically important. Um, we deal with stuff like model drift all the time. So the the, the examples that, that we went through here, we were using largely statistical down select. So Brian showed you like, hey, we're going to look at like what has the lowest number of this crossed with the lowest number of this. So you can think grouping and things like this. But if you've got a uh, couple of ML algorithms combined in there, you're going to want to check and make sure that as you run new data through it, the data that you're running through it now looks reasonably similar to the data that you ran through it before. And so model drift becomes kind of a factor. There's a couple of uh, companies I, I recommend. Arthur AI is a company that we actually use to detect model drift in this context. Uh, so if you're looking into data quality issues, uh, that might be a place to go. And then the last thing, and you know, I told you I could go on at length. If you're using unlabeled data, if you're actually, if, if you're just looking for anomalies, uh, Honestly, you know, statistical methods like, hey, let's look at, you know, what's a couple standard deviations from the mean actually is a dog that hunts really well. In this case, that's exactly what we did for this hunt. And we got uh, uh, 770,000 rows down to about five um, pretty easily. And that's stuff that's pretty easy to do in a sim. So um, uh, your mileage may vary, but that's one of the things that we've kind of picked up. Awesome. Um, okay, another question that just came in. Many times we only see false positives because of the huge volume of logs. What is the process of whitelisting to reduce false positives? So, you know, that's an absolutely great question. So there's a couple of things that we do. And um, so the first thing is in the framework that uh, Brian showed you, we actually have two, um, uh, uh, two pieces to the framework. One is the ability to add a suppression. And there what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, say, ah, I want to try to suppress this particular log. And when you do that, um, we are going to retroactively look back in the data and say, how much of this data would it actually suppress? And what is sort of the statistical neighborhood that it's going to su uh, suppress? So, so in that case, you make sure if you want to suppress an IP address, uh, our platform will automatically tell you, by the way, that's going to suppress 98% of the data. Are you sure you want to do that? So that's one thing is sort of the suppressions. The flip side of that is we also have a piece of the of the framework that is like a it's like the opposite of the uh, of, of the whitelist. It's like, if you ever see anything that looks like this, don't pass go, don't collect $200, don't wait for me to look at it, just make an alert because it's a thing. And that's when it starts creeping over the, uh, the, the, the boundary. What I would recommend is depending on the tool sets you're using, if you're gonna place a blacklist, um, put a, uh, um, do a, turn your blacklist into a search Take a look at the um, uh, the results that you're generating uh, in terms of like you know what what is going to be blacklisted, and then take a look at the statistical extent of that neighborhood. How varied are say the IP addresses, or how varied are the host names, that kind of thing? Because what you don't want is to put in a blacklist that has really high entropy across all its parameters, because then you're just suppressing a hell of a lot of information uh, theoretically out of your data. So hopefully I answered your question, but that's that's what I would recommend. Awesome. Uh, for the sake of time, do we think we can and squeeze in one more question or do we want to uh, round, round this up? <laughs> okay. Uh, for, the, for the sake of our last question, if I am building a hunting program, what kind of tech do I need? Um, so the first thing I think we talked a little bit about like exper like like um, uh, exploratory data analysis, like I'm going to recommend that everybody have some sort of an uh, ETL tool set that allows them to look at a set of data. Now that that ETL tool set might well be um, SIM ingestion, that's fine. Uh, if you have a SIM, a reverse text indexing SIM, so something that allows you to do unstructured queries, but also has counting and grouping, those are key, right? Um, and then the, the last piece is whatever tool set you're using should have the ability, as the questioner just alluded to, to add some additional selector logic. So if it's a bunch of blacklists, if, if it's a bunch of filters, um, if it's some additional uh, uh, routines. We found a, tradi a traditional, um, uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, utility in using Jupyter notebooks um, because we can end up basically doing bulk processing to a set of data and then we end up in a Jupyter notebook where we can use a lot of Python. Um, so that's kind of the tool set there. Um, we just had another question. Um, I want to answer it really quickly. Sorry. Is hunting threat hunting completely blue team or will it come under a purple team? Um, Honestly, I think threat hunting as a function could live in either, I guess I would say. Um, at the end of the day, what we've got is um, uh, threat hunting is a detection activity that you can run as part of your, um, uh, 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 of your normal program. And so if you're, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a traditionally a blue team activity. Um, if on the other hand, you are uh, uh, up against a red team and we do this periodically, we'll launch a targeted hunt. So for instance, if we know that there's a red, like if we, if we see something like, hey, we caught 
uh, detritus of a red team, uh, what we can do is we can then say, well, let's go ahead and, and do a hunt based on um, the fact that, hey, we, we saw them here, but we couldn't get to root cause. Let's launch a hunt to see if we can, uh, 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 you know, cover the corners on where they came in or something like that. I want to put a pin in it. Unfortunately, we are at time and just sort of leave you with a sort of the, the general uh, um, uh, call to action here. Um, Brian and I are both 100% available. Um, uh, you know, if you've got anything, if you want to talk threat hunting, kick around cool ideas, that sort of stuff, those are our email addresses. We got a couple of blogs and we're going to be blogging a little bit more about this as we're uh, focusing a lot on that in the next, uh, you know, sort of the summer months. Um, so, but if you want to kick around some ideas and things like this, feel free to email. Thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time. Really appreciate it.